Welcome to Trillions. I'm Joel Weber. And I'm Eric Belchunas. Eric, we're coming out of summer. There's a topic that we've talked uh, about a little bit before, uh, and it's one that's sort of parallel to the ETF world. And we've got a great guest today who's going to, I hope, illuminate uh, a little bit more about it. Who's joining us and what are we going to talk about? Yeah, so uh, we, we've got uh, probably the perfect guest for this, Patrick O'Shaughnessy. Uh, a lot of people know him. He's got one of the most popular podcasts called Invest Like the Best. I highly recommend it. Very interesting, great interviewer. I was on it once, and my Twitter follower count jumped by like 500 immediately, which was like at the time 10% pop. I, I'd never appeared on anything where I got that immediate hit on Twitter. So just to give you some idea of how the reach he has. Now, that's his side gig. His main gig is O'Shaughnessy um, Asset Management, which is a asset manager that is interesting. I, I, I met Patrick behind backstage at ETF IQ, which is the TV show I do, and he had just filed for an ETF, but then over time decided not to launch it and go into direct indexing instead. This is a little bit what Morgan Stanley did. A couple issuers started to uh, prepare direct indexing platforms. Now, for people out there, I'll just break it down like this. You know, you can get music in vinyl, compact discs, cassette tapes, streaming, right? There's many ways to get your Bob Dylan song, right? Same with investing, right? You've got mutual funds, ETFs, and I would say direct indexing, or as Patrick calls it, custom indexing, is sort of one of the newer waves, although it's actually an older wave because it's it's a separately managed account where you just own all the stocks yourself. And that used to be hard for retail, because and so institutions did it. But now with trading getting cheaper, it's now more available to retail. So it's been democratized, and it's been looked at as a sort of a wave of the future. And so I think it's important to go over this because it is an avenue investors have available to, the, available to them. And it's also a topic we debate on our team a lot. How big will this get? And it's a it's like ESG, in my opinion, in terms of one of those uh, things that isn't no one's totally on the same page about. Some people are very bullish, some people less so. So I think we should dig into the, the pros and cons and, and sort of the future of this area. All right. I think you did a pretty good uh, summary there. We'll, we'll see if Patrick takes issue with that. So uh, again, Patrick O'Shaughnessy, CEO of OSAM, which is part of Franklin Templeton. This time on Trillions, invest like Patrick O'Shaughnessy. Patrick, welcome to Trillions. Joel and Eric, thanks so much for having me. Okay, Patrick, um, I want to ask you first and foremost about direct indexing, which you call custom indexing. Why, why does the world need that? Well, I think it's important to define the difference between direct and custom indexing. Direct indexing, as Eric points out, is, is quite old. Uh, it's been around for decades. I think of it as a very simple uh, product. You, you take whatever exposure you want. Let's say it's the S&P 500. You own all or most of the stocks directly in a separate account for each investor. And you trade those stocks to generate tax losses, which become an asset to the investor, which is possible because of the separate account. So the separate account is the key sort of vehicle, but the strategy is really deliver the S&P 500 returns effectively, but give me this extra asset of tax losses that I can use to offset gains elsewhere. You might call this tax alpha. You know, there's a lot of different terms for it. And that's the strategy. That's it. And you're not trying to do anything else. On You're not trying to outperform the index. You're not trying to do anything customer specialized. Uh, you just are getting exposure plus this tax boost. Custom indexing is something that I think has only been made possible, and we were the first to do it. We, we came up with that term, custom indexing, in the last three or four years because of software and technology. So what custom indexing brings to the table is a million other considerations that each investor might have, preferences, circumstances, um, a tax situation that's different than, than others, which can be accommodated in the strategy itself. So whereas direct indexing is very much one size fits all, uh, custom indexing is one size fits one, which is enabled by technology. And obviously, we can go into it to see how people use this because we've got the data. We've got you know nearly 2,000 accounts that have been open, a bit north of $3 billion managed through the platform today. So we can tell you, you know, how people use this to customize. But I, I do think that like anything interesting, it's something enabled by relatively new technology and allows things to be much more tailored to the individual versus, you know, just give me the S&P 500. OK, so you're like a Seville Road tailor, but with with uh, better scissors uh, uh, for a, a terrible comparison T technology enhanced scissors, maybe. Um but I'm curious in part because we talk to a lot of people who are in the ETF world and 
look at ETFs as like a great technology and you basically kind of like looked in the headlights of the ETFs and were like, I'm going to do something different than that. What, why? And, and how do you feel about ETFs? Well, I guess there's, there's, there's two angles on this, both of which matter. Uh, one is the business angle from our perspective and two is the investing angle from the customer's perspective. So I'll touch on both. When we filed for that ETF, it was because we wanted to do something more accessible than what we had done in the past. And ETFs were obviously big and growing and remain big and growing. But when we stared at this from a business competition standpoint, it kind of looked like the worst possible scenario you could imagine in business. There was effectively unlimited competition. So you, you felt like we were entering a pure commodity game. You, you were entering a pure price war where you're just a, there's no, there is no pricing power. You're a price taker. There's insane competition for mindshare and pre-existing, you know, gorillas. It, it, it just sort of felt like this is the worst. This is actually the worst idea we've ever had. <laughs> um, and hold on, jo- Joel, Joel, that is exactly why I call it the right. terror dome. It, it is brutal. It, it, it really it is. is. Uh, he just described it. I can, I can understand that. That take, it, take it's away, a terror dome that feels like buying lottery tickets. Like some, some pay off, right? There are some ETF franchises that come from nowhere. You know, Arc is a, is the prime example and become huge and great businesses. But the number of dead. Uh, in in that battlefield is is insane, and so as we as I as we and I got deeper into that consideration, we just thought this is just a terrible idea. Uh, but we still want to apply. We were technology experts. We had built all this technology for our own purposes as quantitative factor investors for years for for a decade, and we started to ask the question: How could we? take what we've built for our own purposes and effectively turn it over to others. We're very inspired by the Amazon Web Services story. In fact, I spent a lot of personal time with executives there understanding how they did that, taking something they had built for the retail business and and repurposing it as a general technology. And we came up with this idea of custom indexing, which was to say, take the tools we've built to build our own strategies and do whatever you want with them. You know, Blend passive and active factor exposure in whatever ratios you want. Uh, add custom filters, add add overweights to certain things that you care more about, incorporate you know something like a low basis concentrated stock position into your portfolio and let us work around it in a tax advantaged way. Um, we found very quickly people care a lot about taxes and they care about more than just tax alpha earned through loss harvesting. They care about managing their taxes overall with use of their portfolio. And we saw all these use cases, people just sort of clawing them out of us. Um, so really early on, I have this theory now that uh, in business for a new product, something that's going to work tends to work really fast. Uh, you, you tend to see a pool of demand that was unmet that people are ravenous for. And our early experience with Canvas, the, the platform, was that basically everybody said yes. Like our, our, our hit rate on a demo of software was basically everyone buying it more or less on the spot. And most of those early partners have scaled, you know, tremendously with us with tons of assets on the platform. And so I think I think this latent demand for customization, especially around really two things, ta- deep customization of taxes beyond loss harvesting. And uh, back to your question of why people need this and a, a, a customization of the blend between passive and active factor exposures so that you don't have to choose the ETF that has, you know, whatever, 25% value, 75% passive, you can, you can build your own. Uh, and we see tremendous variation on those two dimensions uh, across the platform. Um, let's explore the tax alpha. I think for people out there, we've said that word and tax loss harvesting. Just explain this, right? So um, I, I would, I'll talk about how the mutual fund and ETF works, and then you can do the custom indexing. In a mutual fund, unfortunately, you get a tax bill even if you're just sitting there. <laughs> it's probably the worst case scenario of all the structures because the manager has to sell stocks to uh, meet uh, people leaving the fund. That generates a, a taxable event. The people sitting there now have a capital gains distribution. The ETF kind of solved for that. You don't get those tax distributions. You you pay taxes when you sell it. Uh, and, and that really is a big deal for taxable accounts. That's, a, I'd say, a top three advantage of the ETF. Custom indexing tries to take this even further, and I'll, I'll let Patrick describe it, but explain how that tax alpha works relative to maybe the ETF or selling a stock. Yeah, and I think it's important to highlight limitations of this approach too, which is you need fairly low turnover strategies for tax alpha to be a thing and to work. Like you, you're never... If you want a momentum factor exposure, which is a strategy that turns over a lot, like you should just buy an ETF. Like th- there's no way 
that 100% turnover strategy is ever going to have a tax alpha advantage on top of the al- the potential for excess return advantage from the factor. So w- what that crossover point is probably like 25% annual turnover, something like that. So we're really talking about low turnover strategies here when we're talking about the potential tax advantage of pure loss harvesting. I think there are other tax advantages we can talk about that are independent of turnover, but the, the famous one, loss harvesting, you know, you need a low turnover strategy. So that's that's the first, I think, key important point. But the concept itself is honestly pretty straightforward. Let, let's just imagine a, you know, uh, a pair of, you know, all the car companies, let's say they're all owned in the S&P 500. They have similar characteristics. They tend to have decently high correlation with one another. Um, one thing you can do is monitor the portfolio. We do it on a daily basis and basically say, okay, what positions that we've bought for this investor are trading at some sort of loss where we can do a trade, book that loss, uh, which is a taxable loss, and reinvest the proceeds in a basket of securities, which have conceptually similar profiles as the one that we sold so that our overall exposure to the S&P 500 remains very constant. The technical term for this would be tracking error. So we have a a, a tracking error budget. We can't get too different than the underlying benchmark as we do this. If the tracking error budget was really large, which is one of the things that we allow on the platform, because sometimes people don't, sometimes people say, I have a huge gain. I want to offset it, generate as much loss as humanly possible. I don't give a crap if I track the S&P 500 this year. That's something that traditional direct indexers don't allow for, but we see it happen. Um, If the tracking error budget was five, which is huge, we can generate a lot more losses. If it's one, which is sort of the standard tracking error budget of one, you're, you're tightly constrained. You can't do too much of it because you start to stray from the underlying index itself. So um, that's the concept is you sell stuff that's at a loss, reinvested in similar stuff so that your overall exposure remains fairly constant and you you track pretty tightly with the with the underlying index that you've chosen, but you've generated this loss along the way. Um, and, and look, there are drawbacks to this. I, I think as you mature a single account, let's say you know you invest in 2010 uh, million dollars into an SMA and do this loss harvesting over time, as markets tend to go up, your opportunity for loss harvesting is very dependent on the market environment that you're in. So if the market's straight up and to the right, this isn't going to be as good of a strategy. And one of the things that we found uh, when we launched was that, frankly, we thought the benefits of, of tax loss harvesting were somewhat overstated. You'd see you know benefits like 200 basis points of excess return, which we just could. We actually had a crisis of confidence. We couldn't replicate this. We thought we were going. We were driving ourselves crazy. And then we, when you dig into the methodology of others, you, you realize, oh, they picked like the absolute best ten-year period. They haven't done a bunch of them. They've made the best possible assumptions on the tax law and what's usable and how much offsetting gain you'll have to to actually be able to capture that benefit. Um, so we saw very rosy uh, assumptions behind that number. But even with our, we think more conservative assumptions, we saw like 70, 80 basis points of annual pickup um, over just the, what we call the ETF equivalent. So buying SPY, holding it, selling it, paying the tax at the end versus doing it along the way as as, as you do in, in custom indexing. Um, so we just think there's a huge, obvious long-term benefit. It is... Is that 70 or 80 basis points like an annualized number over yeah. 10 years or just or how, how much does it vary? It's, it's annualized over 10 year holding periods okay. and uh, okay. it is the average of lots of vintages. So there's lots of 10 year periods in history that we can study this on. Like I said, most of the other studies pick one that starts in like 09 uh, or 08 or 07 when you have obvious like huge upfront losses that you can be booking. So it looks really good. The, the range is pretty wide. Like there's 10 year periods where there's effectively zero net benefit to doing this. Um, there's negative, we didn't observe a negative one. So uh, zero is sort of the lower bound. And like 200 something was like the upper bound. So obviously we don't know, we, we don't control the market. So we don't know which of the, which we're in that range it will fall. 70 or 80 was sort of the average. Um, but we think that's a pretty darn good trade, especially when you layer on all the other customization benefits that, basically everyone uses. So I'm, I'm curious, you're now part of Franklin Templeton and that merger happened almost a year ago, right? End of last uh, year, yeah. Uh, so what, yeah. So how did that how did that come together and why did you decide to link up with someone? Yeah. So uh, to rewind time, this was call it April of 2021 uh, of last year. Uh, we got a call from Franklin. We weren't trying to sell the business. We weren't running any sort of process or anything. 
we got a, a, a really memorable call I did from a guy named Roger Paradiso at Franklin Templeton, who's now the executive chairman and sort of the person responsible for OSAM at Franklin Templeton. Uh, he's, he's OSAM's executive chairman now. And uh, Roger basically said, we have been doing research on these platforms like yours for a long time. We think that the one you've built is the best and we want to we want to partner with you. And he 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 actually knew more about Canvas on that first call, having never talked to us, than probably anyone that I had ever talked to about the platform outside of our firm. Um, so it was clear they'd done their homework and understood what we think of as this huge market opportunity and for a, a new category that we had created. And uh, it moved very quickly from there. I actually was in California. I flew back. I completely cut my trip off, flew back the next day, hiked with Roger for hours in the local woods, which is something I like to do, and got to know each other very quickly. And it unfolded from there. We didn't, you know, we didn't run like a, a process. Like it just, it was clear that they wanted us for very good reasons and that they brought to the table effectively all the things that we didn't have. <laughs> so, you know, we we had been a, a relatively small boutique firm um, for 12 years or so at, the, at that time. And uh, we had a two and a half person sales team, <laughs> which is not big. And I, well, well, those two and a half, you know, I think were were the equivalent of like seven or ten normal salespeople. They were incredible. There's only so much hours in the day, and we had hit upon this new thing that that you know we had never been a big sales organization. We frankly didn't know how to scale a sales organization. And Franklin, with a trillion and a half of assets under management or whatever it is. Uh, had one of the you know most scaled up distribution forces with relationships everywhere in our entire industry, and that to us felt like sort of a, a match made in heaven. Um, and indeed, that's you know what we've seen so far is that they bring a, a bazooka to the knife fight that we were fighting, and we're only eight or nine months into this, so it's it's still fresh and new. Uh, but that's the story behind the partnership. I was at Franklin Templeton about three months ago. I took a, a trip to San Fran, saw a bunch of clients went went out there. Did you? Wasn't it interesting how they share a campus with Roblox in San Mateo? And yeah. so you've got these sort of like these asset manager guys walking around, and then you've got these like Roblox employees like mixed together. Uh, I thought it was interesting. It's a great, obviously, get the best weather out there as well. But it's, I was, I didn't well, realize. You know, that. I'm, I'm a student of asset management as a as an industry and as a business. I, I find it sort of endlessly fascinating. It's where I've spent my whole career. So uh, both in the public and now for me on the private side too, with a, a venture capital firm that I run. Uh, but but the, the technology interest and actions of the big asset managers has, has always intrigued me. And what we saw with Franklin was a clear commitment, and it's a family owned and run firm in many ways, right? The the Johnson family is the controlling shareholder still of Franklin, even though it's a publicly traded stock with sort of a rich history of long-term decision-making. And I think good long-term decision-making often comes back to investments in technology. And and we felt that on the receiving end of the, really the, the, the attention and the focus, let's say, in the due diligence process. Uh, of Franklin onto us was was crazy deep dives into what we had built, which we loved because we've been building it for 12 years. Really, I mean, Canvas in many ways is like a new layer on top of technology we'd been working on for a long, long time. We'd always had much bigger headcounts in technology than than our peers. And uh, I think the best firms are committed to that sort of thing. And so the the headquarters being, you know, on the same campus or right next to Roblox and, and many other firms like Roblox, I think is fascinating. And uh, more than I can say for a lot of the more East Coast mindset asset managers. <laughs> One thing that's important to note here, there has been a total trend of big asset managers buying direct indexing and custom indexing platforms, namely Morgan Stanley with mm -hmm. Parametric. Just curious if your take on that deal, or I believe BlackRock bought mm -hmm. Aperio. Um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming you're out there kind of selling against those other shops. I mean, I, do you have any, you know, comment on the other competitors? Um, I think the, the most of the deals that you've seen that are huge, that are very big, Parametric and Aperio being big deals, big M&A deals in, in that world. Th those firms are excellent firms. They've been around a long time. Uh, they do more traditional direct indexing, um, maybe with some templated customization. You, you can pick a few colors, not just black and the, you know, the Model T joke, but more or less they're direct indexing firms. 
uh, the, the interface between customer and firm is not a soft web-based software layer. And, and I'm sure that those firms will trend in that direction. Um, but it's one thing to build from scratch with that as your intention. And it's another to lay one on top of a, you know, very mechanical Turkey operations heavy uh, business, which is, I, I think, with, I don't want to speak out of turn. I don't, I don't know those businesses intimately well, but I think the M&A you've seen there, and then you've also seen some of the younger technology companies that really didn't get distribution, uh, but built interesting technology have been bought up too by these asset managers. And I think the the, the trend is kind of obvious, which is platform shifts matter. If you missed ETFs as a big asset management firm, you lost. I mean, you you could you cannot miss major platform shifts as a big incumbent. Go study Facebook's transition to mobile. That's kind of the best example of this. Like they ultimately got it right, but initially it was kind of a, a kind of a, a a crap show. And it's just critical. You cannot miss a major change. And so if if SMA chassis custom and direct indexing is the next you know major winds changing category i think all the big firms recognize this and even if they're wrong to be fair they still have to make the bet they've got to have a, a player in the hunt so uh i think that's what's driving it here's where i debate my team others in the industry on custom indexing and direct indexing i i agree i know especially advisors tell me some of their clients hate taxes and this really I everyone think it helps taxes. on the tax front. And I can see, I mean, everyone does, yeah. Ultra high net worth types, um, you know, I, I, I get the use case. I see this more as not a game changer, but a, um, a sort of new pos option for people. Not like, so it was positioned sometimes as the ETF killer. And I, the reason I am slightly, I'm not bearish, I'm bearish versus the hype that, like that kind of hype. And here's why, and I want to get your take on this. Over the past 20 years, 30 even, we've seen a trend towards three things, cheap, passive, and simple. This does kind of try to reverse all three of those. And I think that's why, unless you're really into the tax part of it, or really a hardcore ESG person, I can see that use case. It, it doesn't seem like it's going to be able to dislodge a lot of the cheap beta ETFs and index funds that we've seen in the core of portfolios over the past 30 years. Um, am I wrong? Is it, is it, or do you see it like completely being coming the next thing and getting 50, 60% market share of the funds? Yeah, so maybe let's talk about cheap, passive, and simple. The first thing is the beauty of technology is, is cost savings that get usually passed on to the end, uh, the end user. If you take into account taxes, which in my mind is just it's probably the biggest co single cost that comes with investing, right? Period. Like if you just do the math, the tax fee that you pay is the one you should care the most about, right? Um, especially because everything's so, I mean, all beta is so cheap right now, like, you know, five versus four basis points is not going to matter. But a big difference in tax bill that compounds over time matters enormously. So I think you have to look at you have, it, all that matters is after tax money in the investor's pocket at the end of whatever investing cycle it is we're talking about. So taxes matter a great deal. So when you talk about cheaper, that's 70 to 80 basis points that you're picking up relative to the SPY equivalent, you know, ETF strategy is 10x the, you know, your, fee that you're paying annually for your SPY ETF. So I think on the cheaper side, the reason that we're seeing this grow so quickly on our platform is mostly that, right? It's it, it People are convinced that taxes are one of the costs, and this is a great way to reduce those costs and costs compound over time. Um, passive is the second thing. I, I think I, have, I don't have the exact stat, but it's something like in the six, low 60s, maybe mid 60s percent of the assets on the platform are passive. So when we launched Canvas, you can do it, you can build whatever strategy you want on Canvas. We don't we don't tell you what to do. So we were very curious to know like what well, what would people do? The answer is that two thirds of their portfolio is passive, and about you know the, the remaining thirty five percent or so is is active factor exposures. When you blend those together, the the management fee is relatively low. It's not SPY low, but it's relatively low. Uh, the if you factor in the net effect of, effect of taxes, you could argue it's even lower than SPY. Um, it is fairly passive, like it's dominated by passive assets. And then simple uh, is the last one. There's no doubt that buying SPY and never doing anything is simpler than like you know pushing and pulling levers and, and customizing things. There's also no doubt that the people that benefit the most from this uh, 
in an absolute sense, have more complicated portfolios. They've got these, you know, concentrated stock positions. They've got other tax considerations. They care about, you know, individual issues that they want to, uh, through an ESG lens, govern in the portfolio. It's it's a minority, but it's a very mo- vocal minority. For those that care, they care a lot. Uh, it's like fifteen percent of the assets uh, that would that would be true for the ESG thing. So it, you're right; it is it is more complicated in a general sense, but that doesn't mean there's not a massive pool of demand. So I don't think you're wrong. I don't think that ETFs will be displaced as a huge, maybe even primary vehicle. But when you start to factor some of these things in, and things will only get simpler, providers will get simpler and simpler over time. Like it'll be a couple clicks, it'll be a couple things. If the SMA and operations technology allow this to be as cheap as an SPY ETF, and everyone can get one with you know ten thousand dollars or something, our minimum is two hundred fifty thousand, which probably will be that for a while. But that number will come down because of technology over time, because of fractional share trading over time, etc. So I guess I would challenge the uh, the better you know passive or I'm sorry cheaper passive simple by saying this is kind of a lot of those same things actually. Uh, and it will only get better over time. Okay, so Patrick, another backstory question that I wanted to ask you about was your dad, who you inherited the firm from, and and I'm curious what what you learned from him. Yeah, so uh, the literal sequence is he started. He was one of the pioneering quant researchers in the 90s. Actually, late 80s was when he started doing that research. So, like some of the early dogs of the Dow research that was empirical, a lot of the early factor research around quality and value and momentum. Uh, he was doing that with, you know, Cliff Asnes and Joseph Lakanashak and some of the very famous kind of mid nineties quant researchers. He started a firm called O'Shaughnessy Capital Management in 1996. That became part of Bear Stearns in 2001. Uh, we then spun out of Bear Stearns in 2007, which is right when I graduated college, like literally the like month or week that I graduated college was when OSAM was starting. So technically I was OSAM's first employee. Uh, I didn't know anything about finance or investing. I don't think I knew what an equity was. And I had studied philosophy in school. And uh, so, you know, I got a very unfair, lucky, you know, sliding into home head start in my career because of timing. And I sort of fell in love with the quant research part of all this. But, uh, you know, my my dad, my parents, I should say, they were very laissez-faire. Like they didn't tell us what to do. They didn't tell us what to like or learn or study. And so I'd, I actually hadn't even read my dad's books until, you know, fairly late in life. And it's always kind of been that way. You know, I guess the big thing my dad taught me is like, figure everything out for yourself. Uh, don't come to me with questions like you figure it out. That's what, that's what I did. That's what people I respect do. So, you know, there's a library card. Here's a, there's a bunch of books in the living room. Like you, you figure it out. You come up with your own solutions. And so while well, we've been, you know, fun collaborators and, and obviously deep partners for a long, long time, his method was to uh, really hand off responsibility. So when I took the business over as CEO in 2018, at the start of 2018, uh, it wasn't, here's the business, like, this is what you should do with it. It was, here's the business, you tell me what we're going to do with it. And, uh, you know, it took a year of searching before we alighted on Canvas. Uh, so Canvas was literally on a whiteboard in my office at the end of 2018. Uh, prototype was ready in three months. And then we went to market with it November of, of 2019. So it happened fast. Uh, but I guess the thing I learned is like, you have to figure things out for yourself. Like you cannot tell people what to do. You can support them in a lot of ways. You can give them a lot of space. You can give them a safety net. You can give them um, peace of mind. But for anyone to figure anything really interesting out, they have to do it themselves. And uh, I think that's a pretty pretty good singular lesson. Did uh, philosophy, uh, did that help you at all in this role? Uh, have you brought it in? Who's your favorite philosopher? Uh, my favorite philosopher is a guy named Arthur Schopenhauer, uh, who's a lesser, lesser known, you know, continental Europe philosopher, uh, kind of obscure, kind of a curmudgeon. But the reason I like him so much is that he was the person that introduced the West to a lot of the Eastern philosophy. So Eastern philosophy is popular or common now in the West before Schopenhauer, no one even knew it existed. And so he was my, he was also an incredibly clear writer. I mean, there's a lot of these philosophers you read and it's like, I have no idea what the hell these guys are saying. It is all this lingo and terminology. It, it, it just feels like a ridiculous argument for insiders that is inaccessible. Whereas Schopenhauer wrote 
very clean, simple language, talked about very basic, simple things in life, health, wrote a lot about health. A lot of philosophers didn't write about health. Um, Schopenhauer did, but, but more than anything, he introduced me to the Eastern philosophers, which, uh, I would say are my like operating system or, or way of thinking about life and work and the world and everything else. So yeah, it, it directly continues to, I still read that stuff constantly. It, it influences my behavior every day. Um, there's even individual passages I can point to that, that form a lot of my worldview. What cooler pursuit than trying to figure out, you know, what the hell is going on in life? Uh, I, I just think it's a really interesting exercise for anybody. And Schopenhauer made it accessible. So he's probably my favorite. Love that. Your podcast, Invest Like the Best. What's your your number one takeaway or lesson that you've learned from someone and applied to your life to benefit from? Well, uh, to tie it to this conversation, I would say almost all of Canvas, everything we did with Canvas was us stealing outright lessons, specific lessons. You could even, I think of them almost as like business spells um, that I learned from others. The, the way that we launched and built the product was wholesale taken from a guy named Chetan Pudagunta. Uh, I'll never forget. I flew out there and showed Chetan, who's a partner at Benchmark Capital, kind of one of probably the most famous VC firm with Sequoia and uh, said, look, here's, here's the product that we've built. We think it's, it's great. Uh, it's built on all this proprietary technology, blah, blah, blah. Um, how, wh wh what would you do with this? And he told me, and what he told me was, was kind of the opposite of my own instinct. I, I think of him as the sort of, you know, Obi-Wan of, of enterprise software. And so we just listened, like we just did what he said and it worked ridiculously well, uh, and much better than the plan that I had for distributing canvas. And it was counterintuitive. And, and so I think the number one lesson I have is just like, there is so much to learn from so many people, from literally every person across so many disciplines that can then be applied back to your thing. Um, I actually think you should spend more time spent away from your own industry when you're studying business or whatever, study around it, like study adjacencies, study other strategies and see if they apply to what, what you can do. Because I, I do think in many ways, like our story would not have been nearly as interesting had we not borrowed these ideas from lots of other different fields. And uh, I guess the second lesson is just like, if you expose what you're learning as you go, it is a magical process. Like you, you attract people that like the same stuff, that have similar motivations, that want to work on the same projects. Recruiting becomes easier. Sales becomes easier. You get more ideas. You build a distribution channel yourself. You know, we reach millions of people a month with our podcasts. Like it's, it's a, it's a big platform. And it's all because of me talking to people, asking them questions like that, that. That that sounds so weird to me. And when I started it, I didn't intend any of this, but it's really a smart idea to chase curiosity and, and learn in public a bit. And uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's the reason for a lot of things I, I treasure most. Love this. Audio is a weird platform. Uh, there's this crazy idea called the, Gutenberg parentheses, which is this notion that we may look back in time. I don't know if I agree, but it's an interesting idea. We may look back in time from the print, invention of the printing press to the dawn of the internet as like the era when the written word was dominant by far, you know, of any communication exchange or medium. And that the parentheses might be that this is the only period in history where the written word is, is the dominant form of communication. And the reason that is at least interesting to consider, I think, is uh, audio is way easier to create and it's way easier to consume than the written word. It doesn't need to be as perfect. You get a lot more, there's a lot more room for error. The audience penetration is some orders of magnitude bigger. Like, you know, I wrote a book and in the first, you know, 10 minutes of a release of a new episode of a podcast, like 10 times as many people listen to a new podcast episode every single week as read the book that took me a year to write. I, I just think that's kind of staggering when you think about the leverage it represents. So if it's 10 times easier to create, 10 times easier to listen to, uh, I just think you can do a lot more with audio that's interesting. And if you look at our you know, corpus, it's like we, we've written hundreds of books uh, if you add up the word count. So I think audio is like a sneaky, interesting 
communication method. It's also the oldest, you know, like that, that's, this is how stuff was communicated down through most of history. Um, so I'm very intrigued by audio as a medium and everyone always asks if I'll write another book and it's like, I guess I could, but in the time it would take to write one of those, I could do like a hundred of these. So, uh, maybe I'll just do that. <laughs> I, 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 I uh, agree with all that. I would make two comments. One, the, the good thing about books, like, you know, like your dad, you didn't care for 20 years. And then when you did, it was right there for you. Like books have a, a way, they have a way of lasting. Like they're, they're a little bit more permanent, I think. Um, that would be my case for writing a book because I agree with you. It's a it's a pain in the ass, and unless you like get real lucky or write the best book, you're probably gonna not you know sell a ton of copies. But it it at least it's always out there. I, I don't I don't I don't agree. I you know I look yesterday. Uh, I just have the numbers here. There's an episode we released a couple of years ago with John Collison, who's the one of the co-founders of Stripe, obviously a big you know very popular technology company. It was listened to thousands of times yesterday. Yesterday, it's two years old. And we don't even know, like this stuff has not been around for 20 years to, to know if there's going to be, I, I would suspect that the very best episodes will live effectively forever, just as long as a book would. And they're more accessible. They're easier. I can, I can get one on my phone in seven seconds uh, versus a book that I have to like seek out and, and go after. No, I, I'm not saying one's better than the other. I just think, I think it's on the same level. And we see that in the data that very old episodes get crazy amounts of new listeners, despite being years old. Yeah, you might be right. Um, also would add the other comment I had was video. I get, I'm just blown away by the numbers TikTok puts up. And I find that younger people uh, are just so into that. And I'm wondering, because as analysts and pundits, this, which is what I am, we're constantly sort of trying to make sure we're not missing anything. Because as you say, like writing a research note, uh, can it starts to get a, feel a little old timey. And a lot of uh, information is now put out through audio, now videos. Um, a lot of other pundits in different industries use video a lot. Uh, short videos, short form, unpolished videos. Um, what's your take on that kind of way of communicating to this sort of newer TikTok generation? Uh, my take is that, you know, we should probably do it, but I don't care. I hate it. I don't want to be on video. I want long form discussions. I want to, I, I want the lower pressure, I think, I think video creates a sort of weird pressure on people, both on me and on the guest. Uh, I just don't like it. Um, and, and life is too short to just optimize for the, you know, the, the greatest reach, the greatest downloads, whatever. And maybe I'll change my tune on this, but I, I've said no to video a lot and I don't really care if it means the audience is smaller. I think we reach the audience that we want to reach. Uh, with pretty high penetration and saturation. And we're having these are out, minor hour and a half long conversations in crazy detail about like esoteric business and investing topics. This is not people trying to get like a dopamine hit on TikTok. Um, I think TikTok could be a fantastic distribution strategy for us. I think if we put the effort in, it would be worth it uh, in, in a dollars and cents and, you know, Spock like way. Um, but it's just, it's just not for me. I just hate it. Like when I think of, communicating I when I look at TikTok I ju it just doesn't f match my brain wiring whereas Twitter I it's natural it's Twitter feels native to me uh you know conversing with people putting out charts short form writing um TikTok feels totally unnative yeah. every and, time I, um, every time I've tried it it I, feels like I'm like manufacturing something and and to be clear like I'm an investor I'm interested in investing I, I'm interested in taking capital and owning really good businesses with that capital owning American, the slice of American business making, uh, you know, I do a lot of early stage private investing. Like that is what interests me. I, I just happen to have this other thing that I use as a learning vehicle that is creates a virtuous circle. Like I, I, I'm, I almost cringe at the word. Whenever I hear the word podcast, I'm like, ugh. um, it, it just make, I'm not like the media side for its own sake is just not that interesting to me. Like I'm interested in the content of it. And that's why I do it every week and have been for six years now. And we'll probably do it for, you know, if I'm lucky to live another 60 years. And uh, so, you know, I think it's, I think I'm wrong, but I don't care. Okay. To bring it back to the ETFs at the end of this podcast, I want to ask you what your favorite ETF ticker is. SPY. <laughs> oh, come on, man. <laughs> I mean, look, I, I think it's the answer. Uh, well, you have mentioned SPY a lot in this interview. That seems to be your, is that your bogey? Is that your, what you're selling against effectively? Well, I just think back to your point on simplicity. Uh, 
SPY has beaten a staggering percentage of investors of every stripe of, you know, pick your asset class, pick your, uh, you know, public, private, credit, equity, US, global, you know, I don't care how you slice it. it. It's just shocking. It's the first question I ask in every context, like why not SPY? Like even if I'm making a personal early stage investment, I'm like, okay, I'm going to put X dollars into this. Why am I not putting that X dollars in SPY? Like, to me, that is, and maybe the perfect thing is VTI or whatever the total market is, not just the S&P 500. That's, that's probably better. Uh, but the S&P has this amazing, you know, mental availability and brand. Um, and it's pretty close, close enough. So to me, it is the opportunity cost, right? It's everyone's opportunity cost as an investor. And should be taken very, very seriously. So that's probably why it's my favorite. As, as a ticker, maybe it's not the best. I, Eric's the master of clever tickers. I, I don't know them. Uh, I spend very little time looking at ETFs, but the extent, I, don't, I actually don't own ETFs, but the extent to which I, I would or uh, would change to that strategy or recommend that someone else change to that strategy, uh, hard to beat SPY. Patrick Kujarnasi, thanks so much for joining us on Trillions. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening to Trillions. Until next time, you can find us on the Bloomberg Terminal, Bloomberg.com, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever else you like to listen. We'd love to hear from you. We're on Twitter. I'm at Joel Weber Show. He's at Eric Baltrinas. This episode of Trillions was produced by Stacey Wong. Bye.